Welcome. I, I would be remiss not to mention that the circumstances under which this meeting is held have changed quite dramatically over the last two weeks because there is now a war of aggression in Ukraine and this is already having a tremendous detrimental effect on science. Kharkov is being bombarded and Kharkov, as you probably remember, is uh, the town city where Landau spent his youth and some of his very productive years. So I ask you all uh, in the beginning of this conference to just, when I raise my hand, take a moment of silence for the victims of the senseless war and maybe a moment of contemplation of hope that this horror will be over. Thank you. And now let me introduce the first speaker of our meeting. This is Tatyana Yankelevich. She was born in Moscow, Russia. She immigrated to the United States in 1977 as a result of a direct pressure from the KGB on her stepfather, Andrei Sakharov. And exactly the same thing is happening in Russia. Now it's not just the Ukrainians who are suffering. Russia's, Russians are being pressed out of their country. Um, after immigrating to the United States in 1977, she worked as an educator and as a visiting lecturer, and uh, she also campaigned extensively on behalf of her, of her uh, stepfather, Andrei Sakharov, and his causes across the United States and in Europe. And in 2004 to uh, 2009, Tatiana headed the Sakharov program on human rights at the Davis Center for Russian and Eurasian Studies at Harvard. Currently, she's an independent researcher and center associate of the Davis Center at Harvard. You have the floor. And I can push the button start for you. Oops. Thank you very much, Peter, and thank you for having me uh, here. Um, let me... Um, Yeah, it, it's going. Mm -hmm. When I received uh, this invitation uh, to take part in today's panel, I, I was planning uh, to speak on Sakharov's concept of responsibility of a scientist. This was back in August 2021. Since then, we find ourselves in a different time and universe, and my focus has been necessarily shifted by the dramatic, though not entirely unforeseen, uh, events. Over the course of his life, Sakharov has become the moral authority on a global scale. Regrettably, the public role of scientists in the modern world has significantly decreased. The peculiarities of modern information space have led to the fact that scientists have uh, to compete with a huge flow of expert, in parentheses, judgments and outright fake news. At the same time, civilization has not become less in need of high quality knowledge. This was clearly demonstrated by the coronavirus pandemic and more recently by the deluge of malicious disinformation meant to justify the Russian invasion in Ukraine. Ethical issues continue <coughs> to be no less acute than in Sakharov's time. Scientific and technological advances continue not only to benefit humanity, but also to strengthen authoritarian regimes, fuel uh, and arms race or to be used for irresponsible enrichment. Does the global scientific community have the potential to insist on the ethical use of scientific achievements? Does a unified 
scientific community exist today as a social force? How can scientists protect the public space from quasi-scientific information? On March uh, 24th, 1981, in a bitter Gorky exile, Sakharov finished uh, working on an essay entitled The Responsibility of Scientists. In it, he called for attention of the international scientific community to the fate of their colleagues in the Soviet Union and in other countries where uh, the exchange of ideas is fraught with persecution. In this essay, he named 55 prisoners of conscience in his own country, the USSR. One of them was a biologist, Sergei Kovalev, whose trial in 1975 took place on the same days the Nobel Peace Prize ceremony for Sakharov, and which trial Sakharov was prevented from attending by the KGB. Years later, Kovalev, now a free man, summarized Sakharov's moral makeup as follows. Uh, Andrei Dmitrievich, which everyone called him in Russian, was the bearer of thinking based on reason. His intellectual work, whether it concerned science, politics, or the struggle for human rights, was fully in line with the qualities that define a true scientist. These qualities can be reduced to three freedoms. He was free of fear, selfishness, and free of prejudice. Is it new morality? No, it is the most ordinary human morality, only very consistent. The last time it was formulated with the utmost clarity was about 2,000 years ago in the ancient legends of mankind when the fruits that allow to distinguish of good from evil grow on tree of knowledge. Ordinary human morality, unlike that of the saints and the prophets, is based on reason and on nothing else. And Sakharov's consistency in the implementation of moral principles is simply another name for intellectual responsibility, the responsibility of the scientist. End of quote. Last year marked Sakharov's 100th, 100th birthday. And I think it is a fitting tribute to his legacy to talk about the concept of moral principles and intellectual responsibility. In his essay, The Responsibility of a Scientist, he assigned a special place for courage, integrity, and honesty as essential to the fulfillment of one's responsibility. These qualities make it possible to resist the temptations and habits of conformity. In my opinion, there is an affinity between the worldviews of Vladimir Vernadsky and Andrei Sakharov when it comes to the idea of humankind's planetary unity and to the need for a new global morality. They also share the belief in the power of reason and free thought, the sense that history is a sum of human endeavors. From this worldview is born the sense of duty to mankind, not to any one ideology, a sense of responsibility for the course of human events. In the midst of great terror of, 19, of, of uh, the 20th century, Vernadsky contemplated the place of free thought and moral responsibility of a scientist as a free individual in civic sphere. He considered it essential, speaking the truth with no concessions. This was particularly difficult under the Soviet regime with its total ideologization of science and destruction of its independence. The Soviet scientific community could hardly aspire to Vernadsky's criterion of a scientist's moral responsibility. Even when the total control was eased up after Stalin's death, the fear remained for one's safety, and even with the fear diminished, 
the desire persisted to, uh, to preserve comforts of the privileged class. Sakharov was one of the very few to have the intellectual courage and idealism to speak his mind. Many conformists and opportunists saw him as God's fool. Some, including, including the president of Academy of Sciences, even proclaimed him insane. It turned out that he saw further than most. I find it bitterly sad and grotesque that most of which Sakharov wrote in his address back in 1981 is present in the today's Russia, the country of his birth and his final resting place. Today, the international community faces new challenges and has to live up to its responsibility to humanity. A new challenge is presented by the need for coronavirus cure. Another responsibility is to con continue preventing our planet's self-annihilation in a nuclear confrontation. And much like in the, in the times of Sakharov, there still remains a duty to defend colleagues and other unjustly persecuted wherever those injustices may be taking place. Today, this duty is particularly poignant and urgent with the events in Russia take a dramatic turn. The Russian irresponsible leadership today takes Russia in a direction that goes against everything Sakharov believed in. I am referring to the amendments to Russian uh, constitution that allow the president to remain in power almost indefinitely. Amendments that effectively end the separation of the state and the church, insult and alienate non-Russian citizens of Russian Federation, and make any criticism on the, or of the powers that be a criminal offense. But all this pales in comparison with the irresponsible and criminal assault on a neighboring country, Ukraine, uh, less than a month ago. In my mind, there is no doubt that the horrendous decision in the the, uh, is the result of unquenchable lust for power of Vladimir Putin, um, the would-be absolute monarch uh, type dictator, whose deranged view of history and Russian imperial nostalgia took him down the perilous path of war. I'd like to remind you that this is uh, exactly the scenario Sakharov warned against shortly before he died when campaigning against the unlimited powers granted any country leader, however humane. Over the years that passed since then, and especially since uh, Putin's accession to power, pa Russia's power structures are hard at work to rehabilitate the memory of henchmen, be it Dzerzhinsky, Beria, or Stalin, responsible for the crimes against humanity and mass murder of tens of millions of the innocents. Moreover, many representatives of Russian cultural and scientific elite support the course to crack down on fundamental human rights. Not only this is morally deplorable, grotesque, and macabre, but it contributes to the climate of mistrust and disinformation we find ourselves in today. Today, the FSB uh, proudly declares it is a direct heir to the KGB with its practice of organizing the extrajudicial murders of Kremlin opponents with internationally prohibited chemical weapons. It's worth pausing for a moment to think just how extraordinary this is. A European government in the 21st century is operating a professional squad of assassins tasked with killing its opponents. Speaking of responsibility, let's not forget that many of Russia's and former Soviet Union's scholars and scientists have spoken out and protested the cruel crackdown on the freedom of exchange of ideas, of self-expression, of peaceful protest, 
and most recently the criminal war in Ukraine. They deserve support of their colleagues all over the world. They are increasingly persecuted, often under false pretexts, denied fair trial or due course of justice. There is no doubt in my mind that their colleagues have a moral obligation to speak out in their defense. By doing so, you will be following the path taken by Sakharov, by Kovalev, and many others who chose to defend those persecuted. As Sakharov put it, concerned actions in defense of the repressed will help ease their fate, help strengthen the international scientific community, its authority, and effectiveness. He believed that, and I quote, taking the path of active and selfless struggle for human rights, we change something for the better in the moral image of our world, end of quote. On a less romantic note, he believed that moral choice always proves to be a pragmatic one in the long run. Therefore, I put my trust in your pragmatism. I also want to in invoke Sakharov's staunch opposition and condemnation of the war in Afghanistan. In the short period between the Soviet invasion on December 24, 1979, and his own unlawful and arbitrary internal exile to the city of Gorky on January 22 of 1980. Sakharov issued important statements and appeals on the criminal irresponsibility and inadmissibility of such actions of the invasion. Here from his interview, uh, the most important thing that should concern everyone in the world is the war raging in Afghanistan and the threat of its escalation and expansion. Every day, every hour, the Afghani people are dying. Soviet soldiers are dying, and their families receive notifications of their death." End of quote. Is there any, uh, any doubt what Sakharov uh, would have been doing today? Not unlike in the early 1980s, he would put out a plan, a roadmap of actions essential to restoring peace. In his statements just before his exile, followed by his undeterred stand already after deportation to Gorky, he called the sending of Soviet troops into Afghanistan a terrible mistake that caused thousands of Soviet casualties and, is endangering, and was endangering world peace. He spelled out his ideas on a settlement including a ceasefire and Soviet withdrawal with United Nations forces taking the place of Soviet troops. He insisted that the United Nations Security Council uh, plus Afghanistan's neighbors guarantee the country's independence. The Soviet Union and the other Uni United Nations members should grant asylum to any refugees leaving Afghanistan. International economic um, aid should flow into the country and Moscow should contribute to it. The pro-Moscow government should step down, replaced by a neutral transitional government. Elections should then be held under international supervision. Sakharov also called for an amnesty for political prisoners within the USSR. He said, Soviet authorities are trying to degrade and discredit me in a way that unties the government's hands for any future repression of dissidents inside the country. He proclaimed this as his philosophy. I support a pluralistic, open society that is both democratic and just. I support convergence, disarmament, and peace, the defense of human rights throughout the world in our country and the countries of Western Europe, Indonesia, Ch China, Chile, everywhere, the world amnesty for prisoners of conscience and the abolition of the death sentence. Today, these words are resonant again as Russia suppressed dissent and opposition by maligning it and then invading an independent Ukraine, destabilizing the entire region 
and irresponsibly threatening the use of nuclear arms. This would be a particularly alarming aspect for Sakharov, whose sensibility to the nuclear saber rattling was incomparable. In all his public work, he stressed the inadmissibility and criminality of such threats and has done much for the disarmament and strategic parity. In his 1983 Danger of the Nuclear War essay that was published in the, in the summer of uh, uh, 1983 uh, in Foreign Affairs, it was an open letter to Sidney Drell, a name familiar to, I'm sure, all of you here. In this essay, he warned against the insanity of mutual nuclear annihilation and called on humanity to step away from this peril as a sane man would step away from the edge of precipice. Sidney Drell was a good friend to Sakharov and to all of our family through many dramatic years. He has also done much in his capacity as a respected advisor to several US presidents on science and especially nuclear arms. Much like Sakharov, he would not remain complacent in today's situation. I call upon you as scientists, as physicists, who have a deeper understanding of the nuclear threat gravity to use your influence, your expertise, for the prevention of the use of deadly weapons that would bring death to entire humanity. Together with the energetic defense of not only colleagues, but all unjustly persecu persecuted, a united, resolute, and steadfast effort to end the war in Ukraine would contribute to the cause of keeping alive the legacy of Andrei Sakharov. Thank you very much. The floor is open for questions now. Again, please do remember that if you ask a question, you must speak into the mic because this is being live streamed. Any questions for me? <laughs> I don't think so. Oh, okay. So I, I can ask you a question. Um, what do you think APS should do to help stop the war? Well, I think that um, as, uh, as, uh, uh, as a community of physicists, there should be a, um, a very... Uh, mm, very clear statements on, uh, on the uh, danger of uh, the escalation into nuclear conflict. And uh, um, I know that many professional uh, societies have already issued their statements, and I know that um, uh, American Physical Society has, has done so as well. But uh, th I, I'm sure that there are um, um, co conduits of uh, um, bringing this to the attention of uh, the, the highest level of administration and the Congress, and to make sure that uh, the, the steps that they take uh, are in, uh, uh, in accordance with the, with the wishes of the constituency. Uh, I uh, myself have, uh, have uh, tried to express it publicly and uh, through uh, private channels, and I think that uh, the society, as well as individual physicists, have a way of doing so to bring this to, to bring their concern and to bring their, uh, to, uh, to put their expertise, uh, to offer their expertise uh, in, uh, to, the, to, the, um, to the administration in the first place, uh, so that they can be informed uh, well enough to understand the gravity and the, and the seriousness of uh, of this threat. Uh, I, I uh, that's all I can that's all I can uh, say at this point. Other questions? Uh, 
There are no follow-up questions. Let us thank Tatiana again, and the start of the next talk is at 8.36.
We still have a few minutes. Tatiana wants to make an informal address. <laughs> uh, uh, sorry about it. In my excitement and uh, my uh, emotional state, I forgot that I wanted to um, present the, my colleagues at this panel uh, a, um, uh, something that is now unfortunately out of print and not available. Uh, anywhere, but you're welcome to come over to me and to take a look at the book. Uh, it's, uh, it's something that was done by the Council of Europe uh, back in the uh, uh, early 2000s, I think, uh, in not sure exactly when, but uh, 2000, uh, maybe 15 or so years ago. Uh, it's called Andrei Sakharov and Human Rights, and you're welcome to come over and take a look at my copy. Uh, while we are he all here, but I want to uh, to say thank you by giving this book to my colleagues at the panel. And let me begin introducing the next speaker, Zafra Lerman. Uh, she's not a physicist. Her doctorate is in chemistry from the Weizmann Institute of Science in Israel. And she's conducted research on isotope effects at Cornell and Northwestern here in the States and at ETH Zurich, Switzerland. She has also developed an innovative approach of teaching science using art, music, and dance, which proved to be successful with disadvantaged students all around the world. Also very importantly for the context of our today's session, she has worked on human rights and uh, helped resolve issues with scientists in Russia, China, Cuba, Peru, Iran. Uh, she serves as president of the Malta Conferences Foundation, which brings together scientists from multiple countries, um, mostly from the Middle East, right? Uh, together with Nobel laureates for, um, it's five days, right? To establish cross-border collaborations, and she has received over 40 international awards, including presidential award from the President of the United States. Um, she is also the winner of the Sakharov Prize from the committee uh, for international freedom of scientists of the American Physical Society. And uh, she actually is a nominee for the Nobel Peace Prize several times. So, Dr. Lerman, you have the floor. Thank you very much for inviting me to be a speaker at the American Physical Society. I'm a chemist and I chaired the Committee on Scientific Freedom and Human Rights for the American Chemical Society from its inception till the American Chemical Society thought in 20, 11, that there is no need anymore to a committee like that. Uh, during this period, I managed to work on, with my committee on a lot of cases, it, starting with the Soviet Union, the Refuseniks, and then moving to other countries that you can see the pictures here, like Cuba, China, and I would like now to tell you about my experience. I planned my talk to call for action both for human rights and peace from the audience. I remember when we were organizing in the 80s a symposia like that in the American Chemical Society, the room will, would have been packed. And I think that it tells us that we have to do more work to explain to people 
why now this work is more important than ever, exactly as the title of this uh, symposium here, because everybody should take part with what is going on now in Ukraine. Uh, my mother was born in Kiev. My father was born in Odessa. I was in Kiev several times in the 80s, uh, working on human rights, and it just breaks my heart to see what's going on. So with that, I will, oh, it's not moving. Okay. I had the privilege to meet with Andrei Sakharov in 1988 when he received the Albert Einstein Peace Prize Foundation, and I was on the executive committee of this organization. Uh, I had uh, the chance to talk to him with a translator, and he suggested that before I go back to the Soviet Union, I should take a crash course in Russian, and this way I will not need a translator that probably would have been a KGB member. I, the other thing that he said is never let off the pressure on government when you deal with human rights. I took his advice to heart and took a crash course in Russia, went to the Soviet Union. Uh, I usually went with a group of chemists as a cover-up. In the morning, we were lecturing in different universities. And after midnight, I would have gone by myself. I went by myself. And in dark alleys, I met refuseniks that then we went, all of us together, for a seminar at two o'clock in the morning in some dark attic. With that, I could bring a scientific material to them, what was illegal by that time, and I could take back their CV and work on their behalf. We managed to bring to freedom uh, many of these scientists, and the sucker of advice to me was extremely beneficial because I would go by myself, and all what I did, I would look at my group and think who is reliable and would not be frightened with my activities, and I would tell this person, if I'm not here tomorrow for breakfast, please call the American Embassy and don't ask more questions. It's not moving. Uh, I like to uh, quote here, or oh, you can read it by yourself, Yuri Tarnopolsky was one of the refuseniks that was arrested and sent to labor camp in 1984. Uh, what he wrote there is what is in common for the uh, prisoners that is there because of his conscience and the person that tried to help him. This he wrote, by the way, to the American Physical Society when I was nominated for the Albert for the Henry Sakharov uh, Prize. I hope you had a chance to read it. We thought that with the fall of the Soviet Union, our work will be finished, but there was no change. The only change that happened that the letter case GB will change to FSB. And Alexander Nikitin was a nuclear engineer that worked with the Norwegian Bologna Foundation and showed them where the Soviets uh, dumped radioactive material from submarines in the North Sea. And suddenly he was arrested. Uh, retroactive laws were written to make him a spy. And he 
had a trial. He was arrested first, then he was released to house arrest. I managed to meet with him in St. Petersburg during that time, and with all the effort, we managed to bring him in 2000 to the US. He gave a talk to the American Chemical Society at 9.30 p.m. because this was the only time we had a, a, pl a room for that. It was attended by more than a thousand people. All the Canadian and American media was there and it was carried live on C-SPAN. This is how the scientists was ve were very involved during this period in issues of human rights. In uh, 1989, we had to concentrate on China uh, because, as all of you know, about the Tiananmen Square disaster. And we were working very hard on China. The pro-democracy uh, physicist, uh, Feng Liji, uh, had to escape to the U.S. Embassy because otherwise he would have been arrested and tortured. He was hiding there for a whole year, and when he was released, uh, he came immediately to visit me, and from my, he gave a lot of lectures, was interviewed by many, many newspapers, but the most important thing, he gave a talk directly to China in Chinese through Voice of America for my office. Uh, Professor Xu was a very distinguished physicist uh, who worked really uh, on translating Albert Einstein to Chinese. He was number two uh, most uh, stopped for, but because of his age, and Chinese they have respect somehow to age, he was in house arrest and not in uh, prison, but he was talking uh, and sending uh, statements concerning the students that were in uh, prison. The leader of the students was Liu Gang, that the physicist, he's a physicist, and we all worked very hard on his behalf. He was in jail six years and was tortured badly till he managed to come to the US. Uh, I was invited to deliver a lecture in China in a conference uh, titled Public Understanding of Science and I dedicated my lecture to the scientists and students that I told the Chinese helped to develop the country, but we're now in prison, and I told them that I hoped they would have come to my lecture, but sadly, they could not come. As a result of that, I was interviewed after that in the, uh, on the national Chinese television, and the American group I went with was very afraid that all of us will be arrested, but we came out uh, safely. The same, I had letters with me from Feng Liji to different dissidents. One of them is Professor Xu. I managed to meet him with him in his apartment, but my translator after that was called for a questioning why did we go to Professor Xu that was in house arrest. So uh, working on human rights sometimes uh, is in risk to your own safety, but it's necessary. And now with the war in Ukraine, it's necessary that every one of us will take action. I, I'm sad that a young Sakharov did not appear on the arena because I'm sure 
be, that Sakharov would have a, find a way to directly uh, communicate to Putin to stop this murder and nightmare. Oop. Uh, this is a physics student. The, the APS gave him the Andrei Sakharov. He was arrested uh, as a spy. He was a PhD student here. And we all had to work very hard uh, on his behalf. It's in Iran. Uh, I was asked to say uh, something about the cases now. I'm the vice chair of the board of the Committee of Concerned Scientists that started during Sakharov. And I just took a picture of one page of all the cases we have to deal with. So human rights is a big, big problem around the world, and we need everybody to help us with that. These are the universities, one in uh, Moscow, the other one in Leningrad, St. Petersburg, that hosted my group during the day, and at night I could go and deal with the refuseniks. Uh, Cuba was another issue, and Cuba was really scientific freedom and human rights. The scientific freedom was for us, because we were not allowed to go to Cuba. <clears throat> we needed to get a license. <clears throat> it was very hard to get a license. My senator, Dick Derbin, helped us, and in 98, we took we got the license and took the first group to a Cuba where we could work at night on human rights there too. Uh, this is Philip, Fidel Castro Jr. that is a nuclear physicist and he was the science advisor to his father. Uh, I became very friendly with him and he was very helpful to me during that uh, period, then <clears throat> I was elected as an honorary member of the Cuban Chemical Society. Uh, this is the American that is, was the ambassador, but you could not use the word ambassador. He hosted, I took seven delegations to Cuba. He hosted my a delegation in his house and I put what the eagle there said because it's a very, very important statement for all of us these days. I was asked to tell you about the effort in, for peace in the Middle East using science and science diplomacy. Uh, we are bringing together scientists from all the 15 Middle East countries and now on their request, Morocco and Pakistan uh, joined together. Uh, this scientist spent five days together with six Nobel laureates, developing friendship and collaboration <coughs> to solve issues of the region and of the world, like water, energy, food security, science education, uh, we started it after 9-11, after the attack on the Twin Towers in New York, and we suggested to the American Chemical Society that we should put our attention now into the Middle East. And the first conference was held in 2003 on the island of Malta, because I felt that an island would be safer. It was in the heights of the Antifada, the uprising in uh, the West Bank, where a lot of people were killed, both in Israel and the West Bank, and we needed security for this conference. Uh, si uh, science diplomacy can uh, overcome cultural, religious, and political barrier where other forms of diplomacy have failed. I like this picture because it shows you the difference between the people that come 
to the, to the conference. Uh, those are the ma main reason for this conference, to provide a platform for people to see what unites them, <coughs> and then what separates them, to uh, have a forum where people can uh, uh, form collaborations to solve the issues of the region, to uh, reduce the animosity and the uh, tendency to demonize the unknown other, and to catalyze the collaborations that are being formed between the scientists that may, uh, many of their uh, governments are hostile to each other. Uh, these are two Nobel laureates that are sitting there, Roald Hoffman and Martin Karplus, and those are, regu are our regulation. The most important one is no accompanying member. To the chemist, we could explain it that if you dilute the solution, the reaction slows down and we wanted maximum collaboration so no accompanying member could go to this conference. Here you have the list of all the conferences and the places that uh, we ran our conferences. Uh, the reason that we had to jump around is the visa. When we started in Malta, the two first one, Malta was not part of the EU and the Schengen visa. But once they became part, visa became a terrible, terrible issue. No visa for Iran, no visa for uh, uh, Syria. So the problem of the visa was a huge obstacle to overcome. And therefore, we had to jump around. Uh, the Malta conferences are the only platform in the world where these scientists can get together, exchange ideas, feel protected, because as I mentioned, we have there Iran, Iraq, Syria, Israel, Palestine, and all the rest of them. So you can see here interactive workshop, how the people work, all of them together, and you cannot really distinguish from which country they are coming. The Nobel laureates uh, play a very important role in this conference, and they are really a big attraction for many of the participants to be ready to go to this conference and meet with each other. Uh, you can see here we have 16 of them. Many participated in several uh, workshops. And I think in the next one, we will add a few new ones. It's always important to have dignitaries here, there too for giving the conference a special status. So usually the president of the Republic of Malta attends the conference and opens the conference when we are in Malta and spend time with the participants. Uh, when we were in Jordan, His Royal Highness Prince Hassan, King Hussein's brother, opened the conference, but since then he participated already in several conferences. Uh, Irina Bokova was the Director General of UNESCO, and in 2011 she invited the conference to UNESCO because it was the International Year of Chemistry, and this was one of the last events for this time. Prince Hassan attended this conference too. We have many ambassadors that are attending, so we have dignitaries uh, coming and interacting with our participants. Uh, 
Now we, as all of you know about the SDGs, we tried to work in several SDGs. This is the one in education. You can see Nobel laureate Roald Hoffman with people from Egypt, Lebanon, Jordan, Qatar, Iran, all working together with Roald Hoffman. Uh, the other SDG is equality for women. And you can see here, we attract what is not an easy task in the Middle East, many women, and we opened, uh, we started a women's forum. Uh, water is for sure a big issue in the Middle East. The picture with the dark water is water in Gaza. Gaza doesn't have any clean drinking water, and therefore this is an extremely important workshop. We have collaboration between Israel, Palestine, Jordan, because they share the same Ecuador, and the water is a very, very successful project. Uh, energy is another SDG, and this is one of our projects. It's in the desert in Israel. It's between Israel, Palestine, and Jordan. Uh, we always have in Malta a workshop on chemistry, biolo biology, and nuclear security, and trying to encourage everybody to work really on getting rid of uh, this material. We have, there are only three countries that did not sign the chemical convention, and two of them are in our conference, and we are working on them to persuade the government uh, to join OPCW as the organization of the prohibition of chemical weapon. Uh, this is uh, the first collaboration that happened between Israel and the UAE, and it's on COVID, was unveiled in, on a Zoom, in uh, Malta on a Zoom because of the pandemic, and it was covered by 568 newspapers around the world. In the US, it was in the New York Times and the Wall Street Journal. Another Zoom, we had the president of the US National Academy of Medicine, and you can see, oh, sorry, and you can see he showed us how it affects the SDG. We produced masks with our logo and sent it to all our participants. You see here Israel, Oman, Jordan, Iran, Egypt, Palestine, Iraq, United States. And those are the challenges that we face. I said the visa is a very big challenge. Uh, we have to pay for everybody so they don't have to ask money from their universities or government. So we have to raise all the money needed for the conference and to get the collaboration across borders is not an easy task. Those are four speeches that were made on the floor of the US Congress, two in the Senate and two in the House Representative about Malta. Those are different awards. Uh, the one there from the UN, they have still the video, uh, is an award for peace and justice that is SDG number 16. And this is why we received it in the General Assembly in front of the green wall that you see the leaders always delivering their speeches. And Thank you very much. 40 seconds left, so. <laughs> and the floor is now open for questions. I have a question. So that eagle in Havana, what exactly does the inscription say? 
old the eagle. Uh, it's, uh, it talks about the uh, eagle that was uh, taken, you know, I did not memorize it, but from the main, the boat that was completely destroyed and the eagle survived and they wrote that this is a sign for the survival of the relationship between the U.S. and Cuba. Other questions, please. I have a question. Um, so, uh, Dr. Lerman, you have done a tremendous amount of work the past 50 years. Thank you, uh, off so people can hear. Yes, you've done a tremendous amount of work these past 50 years, um, and we, we are all very grateful for that. Uh, you obviously have a lot of influence um, in, in the world. You, you managed to get all these Nobel laureates to come to the Malta conference. Um, and now we are faced with this terrible situation in the Ukraine. Uh, do you think you, you can bring any influence uh, on that situation with your contacts? I was already approached by few, from, by few think tanks uh, if we can organize a conference between scientists in Russia and the Ukraine, and we are looking into that. And we are looking. Uh, what the purpose of my talk was to get people involved in human rights and peace and to show where, what each of us can do. There are a lot of people that work now free because of the work of different human rights committees. So I hope uh, it's too bad we have such a small audience, but even this audience, I hope you all of you will get involved, and especially now time is of essence in uh, Ukraine. So if there are no additional questions, let us again thank Dr. Lerman. And since we have to stick to our schedule, the next talk by Professor Srinivasan starts at 9.12, and I will begin introducing him at 9.10. Ah, there we go. So my question is, so I teach at a small college in Kentucky. It's a liberal arts college. And the students are often interested in things like human rights. And, and one of the, the things, when we teach physics in particular, we think, well, I really can't bring in these outside sorts of things like human rights issues, environmental issues, because we're so focused on the physical science itself. And, I'm, and my question has to do with thinking about strategies of ways of introducing topics within the context of teaching the science that I need to teach in the course. 
Now, I could certainly design a course that's independent of that, that's collaborative, and th they would love that at the, at the college, but I also want to figure out ways, strategies to bring these sorts of issues into my day-to-day -day teaching, and, and so that every student I teach is introduced to the ideas of uh, the human rights struggle that's been going on for, you know, basically forever. And I don't know if you have specific suggestions for doing yeah, it. Let me tell you, you teach in a liberal arts college in Kentucky. Yes. Uh, I think in Kentucky you better be careful what you bring into <laughs> the class. But I taught in uh, Chicago and I could bring it in the class and my students we are all of them extremely involved with everything I did in writing letters in, uh, because my students were all in the arts. This is why I taught science the arts. They were extremely helpful in designing things what we needed and in demonstrating. But I think in Kentucky it might be a little bit different, but you can bring these things in by talking about the work that this dissident uh, did, uh, like Andrei Sakharov, and then you can bring it as part of the work. Feng Liji was a very famous uh, astronomer, he was a physicist. You can uh, mention his work and then mention how he started all the pro-democracy movement and was the number one person uh, wanted after Tiananmen Square. And uh, so it's not that you try to separate and say human rights, because you have to be very careful, because I read all the time in uh, Texas and in states like that, that if, God forbid, a teacher says something, <laughs> but you can bring it by talking on certain physicists about their life. Yeah, and what, like Albert Einstein, Pagwash started as a result of a manifesto written by Albert Einstein and Bertrand Russell, that was a philosopher in England, and they wrote in the 50s a manifesto calling upon the scientists from both sides, the Soviet Union and the US, to get together in a conference and discuss how to guarantee that we will not face a nuclear war. And so all the powers is a result of the work of Albert Einstein. Uh, my God, you for sure mentioned Albert Einstein yeah. in your class. So you can talk about oh. all his involvement in that, especially after uh, the bomb in Hiroshima and Nagasaki. So you can bring it in. I could, uh, uh, my president wanted me to discuss oh, this no, issue. That, that's not a problem. No, they would support me, so <laughs> yeah, that's good. But you can bring it just because of the state you are in uh, through describing scientists. Yeah. Okay? Yeah. Thank you. You're Thank welcome. You. And since we have to stay on schedule, it is time for me. It is time for me to introduce the next speaker, Professor Katepali Srinivasan, the uh, Dean Emeritus of the New York University Tandon School of Engineering. Uh, his primary area of research and what made him famous is fluid mechanics and turbulence, where he made major contributions to the modern state of the art. Uh, he has also done some very important work in complex fluids, nonlinear dynamics, non-equilibrium uh, phenomena, the behavior of cryogenic helium, and recently he has also taken interests in mathematical modeling of global climate change and biomechanics. Professor Sinivasan is the recipient of pretty much every award given out by the American, uh, American Physical Society, including the uh, Fluid Dynamics Prize, the Nicholson Medal, the Laporte Award and Fellowship. Uh, he also 
has been recently awarded the Leo Kadanov Prize, and very importantly, he is the current serving chair of the Committee for International Freedom of Scientists. So, Professor Srinivasan, you have the floor. Very good morning to all of you. And uh, thank you very much, Peter, for your uh, kind words. And uh, introduction, which was over the top. Um, and also, uh, I want to thank the American Physical Society, particularly the Forum on Physics and Society, which is sponsoring this event, and Dr. Cheryl Spencer, who is here. She sort of shepherded the whole meeting any number of times um, to get to this point. Uh, between the time I prepared the draft of my remarks and now, uh, so much in the world has changed, as others have pointed out already and others will. Um, they have a more direct experience on Russia and Ukraine and will eloquently speak about the influence that this event of the last few years, last few months or weeks have um, made or will continue to make uh, on the lives of many people. So I will not say more about it than bring to your attention the two statements released by the American Physical Society, which are here, just in case you haven't uh, seen it. One was uh, generally condemning the Russian invasion of Ukraine, and the other was against the attack on Ukraine, Ukraine nuclear facilities. Uh, you may also have seen uh, similar statements by the CEO of uh, APS. Uh, these are among the many similar statements that have been issued by other societies and academies. While the direct impact of such statements is unclear, they do raise the awareness and mobilize resources for the causes they support. It also helps us as individual scientists to appreciate what we can constructively do. My own talk will be in two parts. The first part, I will briefly introduce the <clears throat> work of APS and its Committee on the International Freedom of Scientists, CIFS. I have the particular responsibility to do this because of what Peter just said. And uh, I should mention that Peter was the um, previous chair of this committee. I will re revisit a few major points, including a bit about the history and restate some general principles because doing so every so often is actually very important from one generation to another this kind of stuff gets forgotten. And uh, it also speaks to the poor audience we have at this uh, uh, session. Uh, we have to try and see how best to change this as we move forward. In the second part, I will uh, describe how my own uh, views and philosophy about human rights have evolved in the last 30 or so years. I'd like to discuss several shades of questions that arise in this uh, subject. Uh, because my own focus is uh, global, and if I criticize any particular system, let's say particularly the United States, it's because I care. The only way to make my remarks authentic is to draw upon my own experience and involvement, otherwise it will look very fluffy. So I realize that my perspective is uh, quite uh, different um, from those of the other speakers. Now to the first part. In the first 50 or so years of its existence, APS had been very reluctant to engage the public, focusing on its core mission of producing journals and uh, arranging first-rate meetings. In fact, APS went public in 1948 with its support for Edward Condon, one of uh, its former presidents, and that was almost 50 years after it was created. 
and it created a lot of stir because it was uncharacteristic of APS to really get into a public discussion. But APS has come a long way from those days. Part of the change towards taking this stance came from within, clearly, uh, but also from without, uh, because the UN had uh, uh, produced its Universal Declaration of Human Rights in 1948, and the Pugwash Conference on Science and World Affairs was held first in 1957. The Amnesty International was founded in 61. And also, there was a lot of upheaval in the society because of uh, Vietnam War. And all of it really led to the formation in 1972 of this Forum on Physics and Society, the sponsor of our session today. In 1975, the Panel on Public Affairs was formed, which still exists and does some interesting work. And uh, in 19, uh, I think a little bit later, this committee became a part of this, uh, a subcommittee of this panel. But in 1980, after considerable discussion within APS, you can actually read from some of the minutes, uh, it became a freestanding committee within APS. So it didn't have a very easy uh, origin. And the budget, budget was very mar modest at that time, of course, it was $6,000. Now, CAFS functions in tangible and intangible collaboration with a number of other kindred societies, though the style and substance are sometimes different. Um, here is the uh, present composition of CAFS. I put it up mainly to show that Peter was the past chairman, or is the past chairman, and that Michelle Irwin, who was sitting here until recently, ah, there she is. She is really the one who holds the thing together. And uh, there is, of course, uh, Amy Flatten, who is one of the senior staff members of APS, who also works on this. CIFS, in case uh, you do not know, in fact, I know, I talk to a number of people and they do not really know what it is, so I just say it. CIFS is responsible for monitoring concerns regarding human rights for um, scientists throughout the world. Uh, the, this membership actively solicits information uh, from a number of uh, groups and, and uh, people and appraises the APS board of the problems encountered by scientists in pursuit of their scientific interests or in carrying out satisfactory communication of their work with others. It may recommend to the APS board, executive committee, appropriate courses of action. Of course, it is free to do what it wants to do, but usually they follow on the recommendations of CIFS. And it works on behalf of all nonviolent scientists, not just physicists anywhere in the world, who are under detention, tortured, imprisoned, or detained without being able to exercise their rights to legal advice. In recent years, CAFS has worked on behalf of scientists in Russia, Iran, Turkey, and Bahrain. The executive committee of the board has written letters to the topmost authorities in these countries expressing their concerns. And, uh, and uh, not to mention uh, the initiative it took on the so-called uh, China initiative, about which more I will be said later, and of course, the Ukraine crisis right now. In the early years, CIFS used to work via the so-called small committees. The task of the small committee, they are just known as small committees, the task of the small committees was to open correspondence with the persecuted people, usually imprisoned, send them reprints of publications in their areas of science, along with friendly letters, and also write to the organizational superiors, uh, going all the way up to the president of the country, asking them politely to release the prisoners, usually on health grounds or inhumane treatment, etc while also motivating other APS members with similar interests to do similar things. All of this was to show the moral support of scientists in distress and also to indicate to the authorities that the prisoners were not forgotten by the world of the scientific community. 
uh, nominally, these small committees had three members or things like that. Now, uh, this is about CIFS. I now want to transition to uh, the part two, ultimately bringing the discussion to a balance between individual rights and global upheavals like the one we have just discussed already. I myself became a member of APS in 1980, and the same year I was appointed to one of the small committees. Um, I, actually, I was the only member of that small committee in, in fluid dynamics and related areas. Since there were many small committees, APS had, APS had a coordinator, so I myself would formally report once a year to the uh, executive committee of the DFD and sporadically and informally to the coordinator of CIFS, uh, but worked uh, almost entirely on my own. Uh, CIFS would provide me names and addresses of people to whom I should write, and I would spend the first Saturday of most months during my self -assigned, doing my self-assigned job, uh, writing letters, averaging once in six months to a given person, and then taking them directly to the post office to mail them. Uh, needless to say, for a long time the correspondence was one-sided, and I had no idea whether it had any effect whatsoever. A few years later, however, I met one of my correspondents, Dr. Misha Komiansky, an expert on atmospheric measurements, now retired from Tel Aviv University. He told me how important that correspondence actually was uh, for him. Another time at an AIP reception, a young man just walked up to me and said that his father, Richard Hersinski, who was a Polish scientist who had worked on kinetic theory of gases, was also very, uh, very pleased to have those letters, and it kept him really um, optimistic about the future. There might have been others, but I don't know, but these two were just enough to uh, buoy my uh, spirit and to show that the, my work was not all in vain. Now, I uh, kept up with them for quite some time, actually, but not uh, lately. The small committee program be began with only a few small committees, but the number grew rapidly. There were some hundred in uh, 1986. But they were mostly focused on Soviet Jews, and a small number of similar people in Poland. Things began to ease at that front uh, in late 1980s, especially when USSR broke up in 1991. Uh, like it has already been pointed out, everybody thought things would be sorted out then and nothing more to worry about, but that's not true. Uh, of course, nobody could anticipate it, and the small committees uh, sort of withered away very rapidly in number. And uh, in 1989, towards the end of um, uh, this period, there were only uh, six people that the CAFS was considering, one American, about which I'll say more, and two Palestinians, one Israeli and one Cuban scientist. And the small committees were eventually disbanded, um, unfortunately, in my opinion, um, uh, but they were the ones which really were doing a lot of interesting work. And I myself lost my moorings in CAFS when small committees were disbanded, and uh, then I was uh, asked to join the Committee on Human Rights of the National Academies. Torsten uh, Wiesel, I don't know if uh, you ever uh, know of him, he was the president of Rockefeller and a Nobel laureate in physiology and medicine. He was the chair, and he had this amazing ability of just waving his hand in some um, uh, in, uh, indescribable way and use some non-specific words that would smooth out all the tension in the room that was, uh, that was uh, created by a long discussion. Now, CHR, that is the Committee on Human Rights, also employed many volunteers, but it didn't work like the small committees of the APS. So, um, before discussing my own uh, evolution of uh, thoughts on this topic, Let's see, let me uh, say a little bit about what Andrei Sakharov uh, said in his 1975 Nobel Peace Prize lecture. You may recall that he was not allowed to go to the uh, meeting himself, and his uh, wife, Elena Brenner Sakharova, uh, represented him and gave his speech. 
and she was also the lifeline during the time um, Zakharov was uh, in exile in Gorky. Uh, much of uh, this speech was concerned with uh, thermonuclear disarmament, international security, social and political conditions in totalitarian states, especially USSR of that time, etc. So when I wrote my first draft, I thought the thermonuclear issue is uh, really not uh, relevant anymore. But actually now we have to rethink that. Um, in spite of uh, this change, various details of Sakharov's speech do not particularly apply to present conditions, but it has a number of very lasting uh, parts, and I want to take, just take two of them. For him, human rights was not a standalone concern. International peace, economic and political progress, and human rights were inextricably connected to each other. He thought that it was impossible to achieve any one of these goals if the other two were disregarded altogether. Underlying all three of them is an open society that values freedom of information, freedom of conscience, the right to express and publish, the liberty to travel, and so forth. He thought that the freedom of conscience, together with the other civic rights, provides the basis for scientific progress and constitutes a guarantee that the scientific advances will not be used to diminish mankind, but provide the basis for economic and social progress, which in turn provides a political guarantee for an effective defense of social rights. Now, the striving for the large-scale international goals was the ultimate assurance for the prevalence of any of these aspects of human rights and political and economic progress and international peace. But he expressed an important complementary view, and that is, in struggling to protect human rights at a global level, we must act as protectors of innocent victims of governments without wholesale condemnation of regimes that victimize individuals are demanding large-scale changes to occur in their political systems. He advocated reforms, not revolutions. He advocated fighting for every individual separately against injustice and violation of their rights, not merely as a moral issue, but a practical provision of creating international trust and security. And I came across um, this uh, one other uh, statement by another uh, Nobel laureate in, uh, uh, in peace. And it's really articulated extremely well. It says, we are powerless to open all the jails and free all the prisoners. But by declaring our solidarity with one prisoner, we indict all the uh, jailers. I thought that was a very uh, evocative statement. And this is the spirit with which CAFS operates. It does not demand that the government change their pattern of wholesale behavior. It simply seeks to restore the rights of a person uh, in question. If it tries, to be, it tries to be polite and it tries to take no action that may be deemed as harmful to the person being supported. And while APS unmistakably supports free and unfettered communication of unclassified research, um, in fact, it states so. It expressly recognizes the prerogative of the state to classify research that it deems important, and that is a very difficult issue. Let me illustrate two instances that further shape my ideas on human rights. One was the case of Wen Ho Lee, and uh, it engaged my attention because, because it had direct impact on me. Around that time, uh, Lee was, uh, was taken into custody. I joined Los Alamos as a Ulam scholar. However, Los Alamos just then was like a graveyard. Uh, nobody could bring in their laptops. Nobody could connect to anything else. And no serious discussion was possible. So I couldn't take this uh, stultified atmosphere for more than two weeks. And I resigned from that position and went back to Yale. A few of my friends said that I should have made more fuss because of the prestige of the Ulam scholar, but I didn't have the courage to be caught in the huge fight on which the security people at Los Alamos had staked so much. Uh, the, the upshot of it, as you know, is the government alleged that uh, he had uh, violated 
uh, security concerns by downloading some files, and there were 59 uh, felony counts uh, on which he was arrested, but ultimately only one of them stood, and he pleaded guilty to that, and uh, the time he had already spent in uh, prison was counted against it, and he was let go without any, uh, any real case against him. Now, you don't have to go that far back. Recall the China initiative that came into being not that long ago, mercifully withdrawn only a few weeks ago. And several professors who had strong ties to Chinese research establishment faced problems of uh, persecution. The charges varied from case to case. APS, as well as national academies, actually tried to take the principal stand as best as they could but the effect on some Chinese-American professors was palpable. The number of people harassed during the McCarthy era, as you know, is just numerous. I don't want to go back to that. And I also know the kind of things that uh, particularly happened after September 11th. Um, are, we will never know all the details. There have been some kind of uh, phobia or the other in an enlightened country like the United States. And the principle of so-called eternal vigilance in democracies is not really that eternal. You have to remind yourself constantly that this thing is really important. The least was one instance that shaped my thinking. The second one was less specific but more powerful. It was associated with my term as the director of the International Center for Theoretical Physics, which, as you know, was started by Abdus Salam, who shared a 1979 Nobel Prize with uh, Sheldon Glashoff and Steven Weinberg, and the center's purpose was to support the best possible scientists from all parts of the world to mitigate their isolation, a goal towards which um, it had strived hard by creating many programs in the center. I um, uh, think that in the, my initial part of the, um, my uh, service there, I went with the enthusiasm that I had accumulated over my time in, at the APS small committees and also at the CHR in the National Academies. But my sense of the international freedom of scientists and human rights actually underwent an expansion during that period as I traveled around the world in, in service of the scientists from developing countries. I would like to explain that and I would also like to see what it, how it bears on Sakharov's considerations. A little bit more about ICTP, uh, just a few words. Because it's a UNESCO center nominally, and I had a nominally high position, I had access to a number of very important people in different parts of the world. Steeped in my initiation via APS and CHR, and still a member of CHR, I began to, uh, talking to some of them about human rights and freedom of scientists. Uh, but this was a time when the U.S. had gone on war against Iraq and had continued the secret process begun after September 11th of incarcerating many people within the U.S. and outside the U.S. The story of that era probably will never be known in full, but it certainly had a transformational change on the opinions of many countries about the US. And I could see that resentment towards all issues pertaining to human rights and freedom of scientists initiated by the US and of the sort that we have already discussed. All that was needed was to scratch the surface, so to speak, unintendedly, and then the rest of it would come in torrents. I was get, it was uh, getting more difficult to participate in uh, CHR meetings um, from long distance in the pre-Zoom days, so I left the committee in, uh, on very amicable terms. But the point I'm making is that um, this was the time the U.S. had inv invaded um, uh, Iraq under the um, thought of uh, weapons of mass destruction. And I was directly aware of all this uh, tension within the Atomic Energy Agency uh, because uh, I, had, I was connected to that. And the committee was headed by Hans Blix, um, whom you may remember, 
And he concluded later on there were 700 inspections and there were no cause to find any weapons of mass destruction. But um, as an enthusiast for human rights, I was under the illusion that I could co-opt science academies in different countries to serve the cause of human rights. But it was not true at all. It was a startling discovery for me that a few who did respond to my entreaties refused to entertain the thought. If they couldn't give expression earlier to their reluctance, now they were quite openly asking how many Iraqi scientists had suffered as a result of the invasion? How many had been put in prison because they were working on defense projects? How does one country reconcile its massive violation of human rights of so many while championing the cause of a few for powerlessly harassing their governments? The subtleties and nuances of my explanations particularly attempting to separate the government from organizations such as APS, uh, CIFS, and CHR, and things like that, were totally lost. I heard from several people that their governments had subsequently become impervious to pressure from scientific organizations. In fact, if some letter was written, they would not only reject it, but they would, uh, they would um, really take just the opposite attitude. And the only pressure that mattered to them was one of political give and take. Human rights seemed inseparable from peace and justice from their minds, as in fact Sakharov had eloquently expressed. It also seemed to me that a proactive role, such as offering fellowships, mentoring, creating modest facilities, and creating opportunities, <clears throat> these were the activities of my center at the time, was sometimes quite an effective way to counter isolation and alienation of scientists, even if it didn't have the evocative power of rescuing someone from distress. In certain respect, the account that I have just presented is a rehash of the long-standing discussion about human rights movements. One complaint about them is that they focus on the, on the curtailment of rights of a few individuals while essentially ignoring the larger and more egregious facets such as medical needs. Just recall how many uh, injustices were, uh, were uh, committed during the COVID uh, vaccination uh, period. How many countries have no access whatsoever to vaccinations uh, even today? A lack of education, not unconcerned racism that uh, runs rampant in different countries, etc. Their action is like trying to put out little flames while leaving the forest fires intact. This speaks to the first, part, first point that Sakharov made that I highlighted earlier. Human rights cannot be taken in isolation, but as part of the whole scenario of international peace, as well as economic and political progress. In, true, in truth, organizations such as APS do what they can. In doing so, they try to be polite and avoid acting from a position of presumed superiority, moral superiority. They recognize that it will be immobilized, they will be immobilized if they focus only on global issues because their influence on global governments is really limited. And while <clears throat> APS does not always shy away from making global statements, like the one I showed earlier on uh, Ukraine, and uh, the China Initiative, for instance. The emphasis is on the assertion made by Sakharov and uh, uh, Weissel. Fighting for every individual separately against injustice and violation of human rights is as important in our business as in fact represented by CIFS and APS. Let me discuss this a little bit further, the dichotomy between the constant attention paid to the plights of individuals, which is what I did and uh, CAFS does, APS does, etc., and the corresponding sporadic attention on large-scale problems willingly caused by political and military debacles, like the one in uh, Ukraine. The usual argument is that modifying the larger problems, such as the invasion uh, of Ukraine, requires enormous resources, enormous political will and everything. And so any demands made on that front uh, require, uh, unless they're empty, uh, require to be backed up by resources for achieving those goals. If you tell a country not to invade another, well, you have to be able to provide them 
uh, address their main concerns and uh, provide them enormous amount of resources, which usually one does not have. On the other hand, asking for the release of a prisoner or for stepping up uh, or stopping the aggression on a group of people, let's say, um, costs almost nothing except the personal decision of some uh, high-level person. But uh, this argument appears very reasonable, but in reality it uh, forgets the fact that it's a loss of face that is involved in this. And the loss of face is such an extraordinary thing for several cultures and several um, systems. And uh, at the same time, I also think that we exaggerate the kind of resources we need to provide uh, to these uh, countries in order for us to be effective uh, change. Um, and sometimes we take very partial views of things. Um, for example, we should certainly stand in support of political prisoners in any country, uh, let's say A, but at the same time, we cannot ignore the need to take a stand against another government B that practices targeted killings of scientists of country A. We will be outraged if it happens in our country, and we should never really allow this kind of thing without, our, without an expression of an outrage. We have to continually remind ourselves that violation of human rights, arrests and detentions made because of race, and inconvenient stance of individuals, political assassinations because of various uh, participation in military projects, whatever, should be abhorrent to all of us as members of APS and as human uh, citizens of the world, no matter where these actions originate. Each violation debases humanity and eases the way for the next violation to occur uh, to a certain, uh, with a certain degree of impunity. I'm uh, almost done now, Peter. Um, we cannot turn a blind eye to what appear to be isolated events, else we become implicit participants in these malicious undertakings. When an entire ethnic community is put under suspicion because a small number of them violate accepted norms, when a researcher is fired for pointing out inconvenient truths on the escalating deforestation, when statistics on debt and deficit of a nation are reasons to bring um, political action um, um, uh, uh, and our political action on scientists who say something about the earthquakes that are going to uh, happen uh, in the near future. All these and many other examples, one paragraph more, um, are uh, many, there are many of them, and they point to the view that no government can be trusted with human rights unless we as individuals actually act um, uh, every time, whatever, the, uh, whatever our political persuasion. Uh, this emphasizes that we all have to be very vigilant. We have said never again many times, we said never again after Holocaust, but we let things happen in Cambodia, Rwanda, and Darfur. And there is no reason to think they won't happen again. And that's why it is so important for us as individuals, members of APS or otherwise, to act and be constantly on our toes. And why I believe the actions of CIFS, um, for which Peter worked and Michelle works and Amy works and I work, are very important. And it is important for us to be morally consistent. We will never be perfect. We should not relent on high ideals while being aware that we may be destined to, destined to live with moderation and minimalism. Thank you very much. Thank you, thank you, thank you. We have time for one or two quick questions. Well, let us thank Professor Srinivasan again. Oh, question, 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 question. Uh, so, uh, given the current crisis in Ukraine, do you think there's more that APS can do than just issuing statements? Um, this question was asked a little while ago, maybe not by you, and you answered the question, I thought, very well. Um, 
I think uh, APS can try to bring some pressure on, uh, let's say, United States government to act more, but probably that is no, not necessary anymore because the government is so committed to this particular cause. But in general, um, apart from um, uh, this bringing pressure on the government, uh, what I was saying earlier is that there will be so many Ukraine scientists who will be displaced as a result of that. And of course, um, as, a, as, as a result of our intended support for Ukraine scientists, we might be inclined to uh, be very nasty towards uh, Russian scientists, for instance. I think we should avoid both of them. We should really support the uh, scientists from Ukraine who will be displaced, who will have enormous number of uh, problems, uh, fellowships, um, uh, support for facilities, etc. But also be mindful that we should be, we should continue to remain courteous to those Russian colleagues who are in this country, for instance. And I think that's a culture that APS has to bring about uh, a sense of uh, proportion on uh, these things. What happens at the level of uh, Putin and Russian government does not necessarily always translate to individual scientists. And we should be aware of that. Although there are some, always some scientists who are just doing what the government usually wants, same as in any other uh, system in my view. So APS has a lot of uh, work to do in trying to bring about this cultural understanding of what is the right thing to do. I, I don't know if it can actually do a lot more. Um, of course, you can provide fellowships to people, free membership to APS, uh, you know, access to uh, its libraries, etc. But we will have to uh, leave that, otherwise people will throw me out here. <laughs> so, thank you. Well, thank you very much, Professor Srinivasan, for these very important remarks. Now, let me introduce the next speaker who will be uh, participating by telepresence, Dr. Frank von Hippel. He is a nuclear physicist, a professor of public and international affairs emeritus with Princeton University's program on science and global security. He worked with Andrei Sakharov personally as a fellow member of the board of directors of the International Foundation for the Survival and Development of Humanity, which operated out of Moscow uh, in the 1980s. And Professor von Hippel was a recipient of the award of the Forum on Physics and Society in 1977 and the Leo Szilard Award in 2010. Professor Hippel, von Hippel, you have the floor. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Vorab. Yeah. Uh, can you, uh, is everything working? Okay, thank you. Uh, yes, I, I, I did know, I uh, had the privilege of knowing uh, Sakura for a couple of years uh, as a fellow member of the board of, of this foundation. Uh, the, which he named the International Foundation for the Survival and Development of Humanity. I complained that it was the title was a little long, and he said, "Well, what do you want to leave out? Survival, development, humanity?" And the debate was over. <laughs> um, Sakharov wrote a a two volume memoir of his life, which he kept up up to date until until he he died. Uh, the first volume co covered his, his life up until 1987, and the last volume uh, covers uh, the last three years of his life after he returned to Moscow from exile in Gorky. Uh, so, uh, Sakhar, you know, this is about Sakharov's contributions to nuclear arms control. Uh, I'll, I'll talk a little bit about how our, our efforts to continue those contributions in, in, within the APS and on, in my last slide. But uh, Sakharov believed it was necessary for the Soviet Union to have nuclear weapons to deter US nuclear threats. But he had no illusions about fighting or winning a nuclear war. And th this quote here uh, 
is, is, is the picture he painted, the consequences of a nuclear war in 1968, when he first emerged as a public figure after, after his life as, as uh, a nuclear weapons designer in, in this secret uh, weapons lab in Azimas. Uh, a complete destruction of cities, industry, transport, and systems of education, a poisoning of fields, water, and air by radioactivity, a physical destruction of the larger part of mankind, poverty, barbarism, a return to savagery, and a genetic de degeneracy of the survivors under the impact of radiation, a destruction of the material and informational basis of, in of civilization, this is a measure of the peril that threatens the world as a result of the estrangement of the world's two superpowers. And of, of course, now we have a, a third superpower, China, which has uh, recently begun to build up its, its nuclear um, it, it arsenal uh, at, at a very rapid rate. So, uh, so I'll... I'll uh, talk about three contributions that Sokolov made uh, to ending atmospheric nuclear testing, to breaking the impasse over Star Wars, which is a period when I knew him, and, and what he had to say, which is relevant to our current debate in the United States over silo-based intercontinental ballistic missiles. There was concerns about the genetic effects of radioactivity from atmospheric testing that first turned Sakharov into an activist, initially as an, as an insider. In the US, the famous physical chemist, Linus Pauling, had similar concerns and got thousands of scientists to sign a petition to put pressure on the US and UK governments to agree to a ban on tests in the atmosphere. In, in fact, uh, famously, Pauling uh, uh, picketed the White House before going in for a dinner to which uh, uh, John President Kennedy had invited all U.S. Nobel Prize winners. Sakharov uh, estimated in, in, uh, the U.S. and the Soviet Union set off about 550 megatons of uh, explosive power in the atmosphere. Sakharov estimated that for every megaton, there would be 10,000 human victims uh, from cancers and other genetic effects. Uh, and, and he focused especially on 5,700 year half-life carbon-14, uh, you know, which, which would uh, put, made by, by uh, nitrogen capture of uh, of neutrons from atmospheric nuclear explosions that, that he, he was concerned would, would um, pollute the, the uh, carbon pool that we, we and the rest of, of the living, uh, Earth's living systems share. Uh, so on that basis, uh, he, he would have estimated about uh, five and a half million uh, victims. Uh, the current estimate is not that far. Uh, that in fact, uh, when you know that there will be three million cancer cases as a result of that period of atmospheric testing, half fatal. Although it may be reduced uh, fortuitously by the dilution of that carbon fourteen by the all the fossil fossil uh, carbon that we're pouring into the atmosphere. Maybe one, one uh, good effect of our carbon emissions. Uh, Sakharov supported uh, Khrushchev's uh, moratorium, test moratorium in 1958 to 61. And he in fact proposed uh, what we and, and other countries are doing since the uh, our moratorium on, on nuclear testing uh, it, um, it, since 1998, uh, he, he, uh, which was a science, what we call science-based stockpile stewardship, 
basically laboratory experiments and computer modeling instead of testing. But when he made his appeal to, to Khrushchev uh, to, to, uh, that, that the, the, the multi-megaton, actually up to 50 megaton uh, explosions that the, that the Soviet Union was planning at the time, uh, so, uh, Khrushchev's answer was, I'd be a jellyfish and not chairman of the Council of Ministers if I listened to people like Sakharov. This was in a period of, of, a, of a building uh, confrontation between the, the Soviet Union and, and the United States, uh, which climaxed with the Cuban Missile Crisis. Well, and, and finally, actually, and, and then um, Sakharov urged that uh, that that the uh, that be abandoned at least on tests in the atmosphere, and in fact, this was achieved in 1963 after the Cuban Missile Crisis. When, when the US and, and Soviet Union wanted to demonstrate to the public that they weren't completely crazy. In ballistic missile defense, uh, uh, Sakharov writes in his memoirs that, that he and the majority of his colleagues uh, in the late 1960s uh, concluded that in fact, uh, that anti-ballistic missile uh, defensive systems could be neutralized, easily neutralized uh, at much less cost than the cost of deploying them. And also uh, expressed the concern that deploying of ABM systems uh, would be dangerous uh, since they could upset the strategic balance, which means that, that the, um, to the extent that, that the other side thought it, the uh, system might be effective, that would, that would uh, incentivize them to both to strike first uh, the, so that they wouldn't have a depleted uh, uh, missile force if they, if they struck second. And uh, the, these, these uh, the, the ineffectiveness of ABM systems recent, was recently um, uh, uh, reasserted by a panel in which I served, the uh, panel of the uh, a study panel uh, sponsored by the APS panel on uh, uh, public affairs, uh, and which concluded that in fact the current current U.S. after spending three hundred and fifty billion dollars, U.S. had deployed. Uh, a uh, missile defense system that even even North Korea could easily uh, counter and penetrate. Unfortunately, uh, George Bush Jr. took the U.S. out of the ABM treaty in, in 2002, which has precipitated offensive buildups by both Russia and China, uh, based on worst case assessments that maybe maybe we could make somehow we could make our our defensive system effective. The, I, I was, I was uh, a witness to uh, Sakharov's activism uh, during the, during the uh, Gorbachev Reagan period. Uh, when, uh, when he was allowed back to uh, Moscow in the, uh, at the end of uh, 1986, uh, there was an impasse in, in uh, in the discussions between Gorbachev and Reagan on, on uh, nuclear arms reductions, uh, because Gorbachev was putting a condition on uh, on, on uh, proceeding with nuclear reductions that that Reagan freeze uh, his strategic defense initiative, which which many people called Star Wars because it was such so fantastical. They actually in Reykjavik uh, just. Uh, before this, uh, before Sakharov spoke out, uh, the two agreed on on the most important treaties, um, but it was again conditioned, uh, and these these treaties were the inter intermediate nuclear intermediate range nuclear forces treaty, and the and the START treaty, but Gorbachev once again conditioned 
uh, Soviet um, uh, uh, ratification of these treaties on on the uh, a freeze of the strategic defense initiative. Well, when when uh, Sarkov spoke out, and this was at an event that I I co-organized uh, in in uh, February, nineteen eighty seven, he described. The, this strategic defense initiative as a Maginot line uh, in space, expensive and ineffective. And he argued that, that, uh, that Gorbachev would, should forget about it, uh, that the, that the uh, strategic defense initiative would collapse under its own weight, which it did, and that he, he should just sign these treaties. And in fact, uh, shortly thereafter, Gorbachev did, did sign those treaties. Now, now with regard to um, uh, silo-based intercontinental ballistic missiles, at that same speech at, in, in, in the forum, uh, Sakharov said that, that um, and we're, we're debating this issue now, uh, of, of silo-based intercontinental ballistic missiles in the United States. Uh, he said, a large part of the Soviet Union's thermonuclear capabilities and powerful silo-based missiles with multiple warheads. Such missiles are vulnerable to preemptive strike by the modern highly accurate missiles of the potential enemy. A country relying ma mainly on silo-based weapons may be forced in a critical situation to launch a first strike. So today, silo-based ICBMs constitute the principal source of military strategic instability. Well, in fact, uh, he was right. And today, ever since the late 1970s, uh, US-based Minuteman ICBMs, uh, which, 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 uh, which are based in silos as shown in, the, in this picture I, I have on my slide, uh, have been on a hair trigger launch on warning posture. There have been a number of false warnings. Some of them uh, have only been uh, uh, identified as false after uh, the time al allocated to the early warning uh, crews uh, to, to make that recommendation. And they were, they were fired as, as a result of, of uh, taking too much time uh, to save the world. Uh, former Secretary of Defense Perry and many others, including myself, have urged that we retire our silo-based ICBMs. But uh, at the moment, uh, uh, Congress is funding uh, uh, the, the um, development of a new missile uh, to replace uh, our Minutemen uh, based Minutemen missiles in these same silos. So this this is um, something that activists really uh, in the arms control area really need to engage with. So in my my final slide. Um, well, I have two actually. <laughs> uh, uh, Sakharov contributed importantly to the development of US Soviet of the US Soviet deterrence relationship when while well, he was a weapons designer but he was not at all com uh, comfortable with mutually assured destruction uh, as an insider he helped achieve the atmospheric test ban and the ABM treaty and as as an outsider he helped Gorbachev and Reagan achieve the, the treaties that actually reduced nuclear weapons, the INF and START treaties of, of the late 80s uh, and early 90s. He did, he did his weapons work as a brilliant cog in a huge bureaucratic machine. His arms control work, he did as an autonomous human being. And then I do have a, a final slide. And, and, and this is, if you want to carry on the work of Sakharov and others to prevent nuclear war, and a danger that we're very conscious of currently in the in, in the context of this crisis over Russia's invasion of of Ukraine. Uh, I invite you to 
to join the Physicist Coalition for Nuclear Threat Reduction. This, this, this coalition was established uh, 18 months ago as, as a, under the auspices of the American Physical Society. In fact, the American Physical Society Innovation Fund uh, contributed, uh, has contributed $100,000 a year uh, to the coalition for its, its first two years. Uh, we, we have, uh, you know, we, we've been, a core group of us have been giving colloquia around the country, physics colloquia around the country on um, trying to give, explain what the current situation is uh, with regard to the dangers of nuclear weapons use and, and policy initiatives uh, that we could undertake to reduce that danger. Uh, so far we've, with, with the blessings of the APS, we've lobbied Congress on three issues uh, to urge the president to extend the New START Treaty, which is the last U.S. arms control treaty uh, standing. Uh, and, and in fact, President Biden did that uh, within, uh, it was about 10 days left before it was going to expire when he, when he became president. We, we've urged Congress not to fund a resumption of US underground testing, which is something that the Trump administration was interested in. Uh, and in fact, um, uh, the, the, uh, in, in the uh, negotiations between the House and the Senate on the uh, defense authorization, the annual defense authorization where, where the Senate had put funding for a resumption of US nuclear testing uh, the, they agreed to take that out. And we have been urging recently uh, President Biden to adopt a no first use policy for nuclear weapons. Uh, that's in the context of uh, the Biden administration's nuclear posture review, uh, which is, which is uh, still ongoing, but um, maybe, maybe uh, released as, as early as, as next month. So if you would like to join the Physicist Coalition, I, get, I show here a, um, a, a link uh, to this webpage uh, at, on the APS site, it's a, a policy slash nuclear. Uh, and also there is a, uh, our, our one staff member, Charlotte Sullivan, uh, can be found. Uh, at, at this meeting uh, in the exhibition hall, uh, F, I think at room F1 on level three. Uh, and, and you could uh, find out more about the uh, coalition there and even sign up if, if you are so inclined. So that's, that's the end of my, my presentation. Thank, uh, thank you very much. Share my Questions, please. We have plenty of time. Tatiana, please. Is that mic live? Uh, Frank? Yes. Na nice to see you. Uh, <laughs> if only to, virtually to, 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 to be with you again. I have a, uh, first of all, thank you very much for your remarks. I think it's very important that you have uh, listed uh, Sakharov's contributions to, uh, uh, to the deterrence and to disarmament. And uh, I uh, would appreciate if you could email that link, perhaps, to the chairman of our session so that uh, we may all have that because I would very much like to look into this uh, issue a little bit further uh, in the future. And I have a couple of questions for you regarding um, the current moment. Uh, unfortunately, I don't see your last page uh, right now, but uh, I'll try to, to remember. Do you think that, um, uh, uh, that now is the right moment to um, uh, to uh, to to uh, renew or to to extend the uh, the treaty with Russia, uh, and also to um, to adopt a no first use um, uh, 
uh, initiative uh, um, because I and also maybe that could be used as a, a lever um, to persuade um, persuade Putin uh, to step down from the uh, from his aggressive moves in Ukraine and elsewhere. Because in my mind, there is no doubt that uh, his quarrel is not with Ukraine, but with the uh, Western liberal order, and he will not stop there if uh, Ukraine falls. So perhaps Biden should use these two things. I don't think Putin will be interested in renewing the treaty at this time, but the uh, no first use could be used as a lever in persuading him to, to de-escalate uh, the war. What are your thoughts on that? Yes, the, the treaty uh, was renewed in, in um, uh, February 2021, and it, it, it goes on till uh, it expires in, in 2026. Uh, so uh, there's, no, there's no leverage there. The, on, on no first use, you know, I, I, um, when there have been exercises, uh, war games, uh, and uh, and then, you know, one side or the other uses nuclear weapons first. Uh, the the experience has been that uh, that that the it, uh, it doesn't end until there's basically both sides have used their nuclear weapons and and there's a, a global Armageddon. So I think the only and I, I think Sakharov. Would agree that the that the only uh, responsible position is no first use. Un, un, uh, the, the the Russian position is is uh, that uh, the, the enunciated doctrine, although it's certainly inconsistent with what what Putin has been saying recently, uh, is is that. Uh, Russia will use nuclear weapons only if the existence of the state is at risk. Now, in fact, he's been he's been threatening the use of nuclear weapons if you know if if the uh, uh, the West uh, uh, crosses a, a line in support of Ukraine, which and an unspecified line. So so that's completely irresponsible, and and. Um, but but for us to you know to to uh, feed into that kind of dynamic and say well maybe we'll use nuclear weapons first you know I I, I think it just just puts the global civilization at risk it's, it's terrible what's happening in Ukraine uh, and, and can we I should use can I offer a direct quote from Mr Putin yes if Russia has if, if the world has no use for Russia, what use has Russia for the world? End quote. Yeah, it's a very frightening time. It's a very frightening time. And I, th I think, uh, you know, we, we, many of us, most, you know, including me, we, we thought uh, that with the end of the Cold War, we had sort of ended the, the uh, nuclear, the danger of nuclear war. Obviously, we're, we're wrong. Uh, but we demobilized, and and our physicist coalition is is a part of of the remobil an attempt to remobilize the physicists, and and hopefully, hopefully after this, you know, if we don't have a nuclear war uh, after this crisis, uh, the public also will be more give a higher priority to uh, reducing the, the danger of nuclear war. Thank you, thank you, Tatiana. I have a question, uh, uh, Dr. Hippel. This is Cheryl Spencer, who helped to arrange this session. Yes, uh, thank you. I, I thought the intermediate nuclear forces uh, treaty, was the, which Trump took us out of, was another of Putin's uh, worries. And speaking of, of using 
coming back into treaties as a as a as a off ramp for Putin. We're looking for off ramps to get Putin to agree that he doesn't need to be fighting a war in Ukraine. So is what's your opinion on the INF treaty being restarted? Yeah, yes, uh, thank you, Cheryl. And thank you for all the work you've done to organize this session. Um, the the uh, uh, Trump took us out of the INF treaty uh, be, uh, because of uh, Russian violations. Uh, the the uh, Russia uh, accused uh, the U.S. of violating uh, the INF as well uh, by putting deploying into Romania and Poland uh, launch systems, which which are uh, which we said and and I think it's. True, uh, we're, we're for missile interceptors, uh, for for to intercept missiles uh, from Iran, which actually didn't materialize. Um, the the uh, so so there was blames on both sides. Uh, the the Biden administration has has uh, the well Russia has has offered uh, to uh, not deploy. Uh, it, it is, is in effect acknowledged that it has um, uh, made intermediate range uh, missiles. It is offered not to deploy them in Europe. And, and the US uh, has offered to, to provide assurances uh, that uh, it doesn't have an uh, uh, intermediate range uh, missiles deployed in, in Western Europe, uh, which, which would require uh, some kind of verification that there are no missiles in those launchers in, in Poland and Romania or, or removal of those, of those, um, of those launchers. So, so uh, th there I think there's an open door. Uh, 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 the US has offered an open door as, as part of its diplomatic efforts to to avoid what happened, which which, which was the, the invasion of of Ukraine, uh, and uh, and that could be part of the off ramp uh, if if uh, Putin decides uh, you know not to not to continue with this with these uh, atrocities that, that he's committing in connection with his attempt to. Uh, to take over Ukraine. How much time do we have? Uh, just a little. So I have another question. So, <laughs> okay. Yeah, so time maybe for another question. Okay, I, I have an, another question <clears throat> and comment. So uh, the treaty on the prohibition of nuclear weapons is currently in force for the 57 countries who have ratified it. It seems to me that the abolition of nuclear weapons anywhere is really what we should all be aiming for. I'm disappointed that the, uh, this APS program, Nuclear Threat Reduction, doesn't actually uh, address the TPNW and uh, my own influence on this is, has not been sufficient, but I would uh, tell everybody that uh, when you look at the 57 countries who've signed the TPNW, they represent 60% um, of the world's population, and the southern half of our world have, have declared themselves a nuclear-free uh, zones, nuclear weapons-free zones. So, all this talk of no first use and stuff is, is not sufficient. So what, uh, and it's our Senate that has to ratify any treaty, including the TPNW. So Frank, um, what do you think we could be doing to, to get the TPNW uh, ratified in more countries? I, I agree with you, uh, Cheryl, that this is a very important development. Uh, the the uh 
this movement for, for the treaty on, on the prohibition of nuclear weapons. Um, and, you know, the, the uh, five nuclear weapon states that are, are uh, acknowledged as such in the non-proliferation treaty have all rejected that treaty. I, but I, I think, in fact, there's this progress. Um, and, and right now, globally, this is the, the, the biggest movement uh, for, for nuclear disarmament, and, and, and I'm grateful to it. I think that the, the progress right now is actually not so much in the weapon states, um, but in the so-called nuclear umbrella states. There are about 30 countries which the US uh, has, has offered its nuclear umbrella to, the NATO states, Japan, South Korea, Australia, uh, maybe a couple of others. Uh, and in those states, uh, I, th I think uh, there is some of them, you know, Germany, the Netherlands, for example, there, there really is um, some interest and, and uh, at least in, in participating as, as observer countries. But I think th this, this will, uh, will, you know, this, this is restarting the debates in those countries about, uh, in, in the NATO countries, about, about NATO as a nuclear alliance and, and whether they really want uh, U.S. nuclear umbrella. Right now, I suspect that they do. Uh, but but, uh, but, but it, it eventually, they, they, they're going to have to give that up or at least uh, urge the U.S. to have a no first use policy, which, which in fact, um, their governments have been urging the U.S. not to have, uh, have been arguing against a no first use policy. Thank you very much, Professor von Kippel. Thank you. It is time for me to introduce our next speaker, Alexander Kabanov, who is a distinguished professor at the Eshelman School of Pharmacy at University of North Carolina, Chapel Hill. And uh, he has made significant impacts on the state of the art in nanomedicine by introducing polymeric micelles, polyelectrolyte complexes, nanogels, and uh, exosomes for therapeutic delivery of small drugs. Um, his honors are a very interesting list, including uh, the NSF Career Award, the Russian uh, American Scientist Association George Gamov Award, and the Lenin Komsomol Prize. And uh, he is a member of National Academy of Inventors. Uh, he served as president of Russian American Science Association for a while. He is director at large of Controlled Release Society. And he has recently been uh, distinguished as a fellow of the American Association for the Advancement of Science. Well, uh, thank you very much for your kind introduction. And uh, it's, a, it's a great honor for me to speak today. Uh, obviously, we live in very challenging times. And I somehow uh, think that that might be my most important talk in my life. And one of the most difficult I uh, got together with American uh, Physical Society while being a chemist about a year ago as a president of Russian American Association uh, of Scientists. Uh, we co-organized the uh, symposium uh, dedicated to Andrei Sakharov. Um, and I was uh, planning 
to speak on this topic. And actually, the title of my presentation hasn't changed. But the content has been uh, changed dramatically in last three weeks of this horrible war, which was unleashed by Russia over Ukraine. Today, uh, many friends of mine and many people of Russian descent uh, tell themselves and uh, each other that I'm ashamed to be Russian. I was thinking about that. And frankly, I'm not ashamed to be Russian as well as I have Jewish, I have Armenian, I'm not ashamed to be American. But I think of the words of Adam Michnik, who formulated that patriotism is defend, defined as the measure of shame a person feels for crimes committed on behalf of his people. And I'm deeply patriotic. Everyone has his or her own images of this war already, and we will have much more. One of the images which uh, affected me was uh, the Russians uh, storming the nuclear facilities. And actually, this is related to science and to me personally, because uh, my father, academician Viktor Kabanov, gave his health and ultimately life in decontamination effort in Chernobyl. As a polymer chemist, he was on the ground with the Soviet chemical defense troops. Many of his friends, including, by the way, uh, the general in charge of Soviet defense troops, have given their life in, in that effort. And it has been heartbreaking to see today Russian troops were storming the very same Chernobyl site where my father and his friends were essentially saving lives. Another very personal thing was the declaration of the Russian rectors, which uh, was in support of the war. That has been highly advertised and discussed already in the global community as a shameful uh, act by Russian universities, as is something which is showing uh, that uh, Russian academia must be boycotted. To me, it's uh, personally very difficult to see this declaration because I am a secondary appointment, a professor of the chemical department of Moscow State University and still continue to teach. This declaration of nearly 200 Russian rectors is, of course, very, uh, very uh, despicable. And the rector of my university, Professor Sadovnichin, has signed this declaration as the chair of the rector's union. I don't want to uh, put too much shame and blame personally at him because I personally know him for 30 years. And I don't want to characterize this act. I just want to mention that uh, many uh, Russian students were arrested during the demonstration and thus far no one was expelled in Moscow University. I hope that won't change. But thinking about this event, I go back to another historical event over 100 years ago. That is a case in Moscow University of so-called Kaso crisis. Kaso was the minister of education in Cyrus, Russia. And in February 1911, the leadership of Moscow University, Rector Manuilov, 
assistant director Mensbeer and Provost Minakov were fired by Kasso because they refused to agree to a police actions at the territory of Moscow University against the students. And in response to their firing, very rapidly, nearly 100, over 100, professors and uh, other faculty uh, of Moscow University resigned in protest. And among those were some of the greatest names in Russian science. To me, this story is also personal because my great-grandfather, Professor Nikolai Alexandrovich Kapanov, was among the first who resigned. So now, I want to also say that one of the university students has written a declaration in protest of the war. And while I will be speaking about some other declaration, verbiage-wise, this one is perhaps the strongest. And it was signed by over 7,000 alumni, faculty, and students, and graduate students of Moscow University. I translated this declaration, and each statement in that, and there, there are more, are just very powerful. And I've just tweeted it by statement to statement. We students, graduate students, teachers, staff, and graduates of the oldest university in Russia categorically condemn the war that our country unleashed in Ukraine. The losses inflicted during the six days, and that was when the declaration was published, of a bloody war, first of all human, but also social, economic, cultural, are irreplaceable. We demand that the leadership of Russia immediately cease fire, leave the territory of the sovereign state of Ukraine and end this shameful war. We ask Russian citizens who care about its future to join the peace movement. We are against war. So uh, this is the top building is the chemistry department where I'm a professor. And now I'm kind of thinking about this in historical contest and my great-grandfather resigned from Moscow University in support of the leadership of Moscow University. And I think that, of course, if the sanctions would require me to do so, I will officially resign from Moscow University. However, I don't think that I want to leave the professors of Moscow University in opposition of what the leadership of Moscow University have done and in support of that student as well as others, and many others whom I know. Let them fire me if they want. I want to say that there were a number of letters and protests by the Russian academics during these days. The first letter, which was written uh, within the first hours after the invasion, is the most famous letter signed by over 8,000 uh, scientists across Russia including Konstantin Novoselov, um, by the way, um, a physicist. And this letter was, is still out. And uh, the site was shut down, but uh, the Russian diaspora organized another 
site. It was published in T variant uh, uh, newspaper. It became T invariant located here, and all these signatures are still there. I mentioned you the letter of Moscow State University currently. It is uh, signatures are removed because people are harassed. Students from the list of President's Foundation of Talent of Success. This is pr Mr. Putin's really beloved project. I've uh, visited uh, um, that place um, in December 21, and I spoke to this bright young students, I was amazed. I thought that this is Russian future. So 100 of the uh, awardees uh, have written a very strong letter. Moscow Physical Technical University, another top school in Russia, has protested against the war. The community of the highest school of economics, over 300 Russian economists, Russian-speaking sociologists and social scientists. Uh, I'm sorry for typa. It's over 100 medical professionals, over, over 11,000 medical professionals have written a letter. So these letters were also in parallel uh, joined by the statements of the Russian diaspora. In fact, within the first hours of the nation, the Russian-speaking academic diaspora has written a letter uh, which was signed, by the way, by Andrei Game, a physicist, and uh, a very notable and powerful letter by the scientists from former USSR. These letters reflect that at least over 30, 40,000 people put on notice and have openly spoken in Russian academia against the war. Well, the Russian government has retaliated. Thousands of Russian anti-war protesters were arrested, including many faculty and students. Police FSB visit signatories of the anti-war letters. I know that firsthand including members of Russian academia. Over 85, 85 members of the Russian academia has, have signed the first anti-war letter I cited. Expulsion of students has been already happening, in particular in St. Petersburg University, and maybe much more. State Duma very rapidly adopted a law under which one can get up to 15 years in prison for speaking against the war in Ukraine. In fact, you cannot call it war. Just that is a crime. And of course, you can get up to 15 years in prison for criticizing Russian troops action. I have to tell you that less than 20 people after those uh, laws out of 8,000 Russian academics who signed the first letter removed their signature. Less than 20 people. Other harassments include police visiting wives of those who signed, inviting them to police and threatening. And of course, the latest, two days ago, message from Mr. Putin in his TV speech focusing on scams and traitors and fifth column is reminiscent of two horrible regimes of the 20th century. It's not surprising that Nearly, well, the same day the war began, the Russian Supreme Court has shut down finally the memorial organization, an organization which brings reconciliation and memory of the victims 
of Stalin's regime. It's very telling. Those who wanted to re destroy Memorial and Sakharov, Andrei Sakharov one, was one of the founders of this uh, organization. The organization which is really deeply important for our society in Russia, those definitely do that because they feel unity with those who committed those crimes and perhaps want to just go forward with something like that. What about Russian Academy of Sciences? As a member of Russian Academy of Sciences, I have been watching closely what was happening. My dear colleague in general, another laureate of the Gamov Award, and one of the most cited scientists living on Earth today, biologist Eugene Kulnin, who was the same year as me elected as a foreign member of the Russian Academy of Sciences, on the 26th of February wrote a letter to the president of the Russian Academy requesting immediate condemnation of the action of the uh, Russian government and the war. And he resigned, or he declared that he resigned as uh, the foreign member be because of the silence of the academy regarding the war. At the same time, very soon, another member of Russian Academy, academician Andrei Rutskoy, has written another letter to president uh, of the Russian Academy in which he de facto accused those members of the academy and those in the scientific community who stood against the war and in particular signed this first letter. And that was a threatening letter in which you see the words, our intellectuals in times of hardship shout to our soldiers' backs, you are murderers, thereby supporting every enemy of Russia. I have to say that on the, on, on the 7th of March, the Presidium of the Russian Academy of Sciences met, and they unanimously signed a declaration which de facto stops, calls for, to stop the military activities, and de facto calls for the peaceful se settlement. Of course, the language of this declaration is no comparison with what the scientists wrote, or what Rasa wrote, or what Western community states. And it has listing refer, uh, referral to the Donbas and Ukraine as separate entities. But you should understand that under Russian adopted laws, you cannot call Donbass a part of Ukraine. That would be a crime. So I'm, I'm thinking about that. First of all, I have supported Zhenya Kunin in his letter to, to, to essentially refuse the membership of the, uh, a foreign membership of the Russian Academy. I'm thinking myself as a Russian citizen, and I'm Russian and American citizen, that as a member of Russian Academy, if I step down, there will be one less signatory or in the Russian Academy of that anti-war protest. Would it do any good? And I think, uh, Russian Academy rarely exp expelled anyone. Um, they never expelled Sakharov, which was considered a decent act by the Academy. They did expel Gamov in the past. But I am not going uh, to resign as a member of a Russian Academy when I still can talk 
to the president of Russian Academy and convince him to do things which I think noble. The war has brought tremendous humanitarian crisis, abuse of human rights. The ongoing Russian invasion has led to major crisis in Ukraine. More than three million Ukrainians, including one million of children, have fled to neighboring countries to escape the war. Russian citizens who oppose the war are subject to arrest and persecution. Over 200,000 of them are estimated to leave the, uh, left Russia within the first 10 days. Heavily geared towards professionals. Finally, many citizens of Belarus have been leaving Belarus after the mass protest and government persecutions in August 2020, and we should not forget about this group. Each group has scientists. In fact, heaviest loss is currently in Ukraine. In just two cases of the students and scientists being killed during the military action. It's tremendously heartbreaking and sad. What do we have to do? We definitely must focus on the support of displaced Ukrainian students and scholars. And here, American Physical Society could do, I think, a lot. Members of the international academic community have pledged their support by offering host to host as many Ukrainian colleagues as possible in their laboratories and research centers across the globe. So there are several such sites. Uh, which were populated by different labs saying, yes, I can take the postdoc, I can take a graduate student, it will be positioned with pay. It's open. And so you can do that and try to bring those displaced scientists to your labs, thus offering them opportunity to continue their education or research ultimately to the better of the humankind and to rebuilding of Ukraine, which I'm sure will be free. Today, emergency funding is needed to provide on-site and remote training and job opportunities for displaced students and professionals from Ukraine. So this is another area where we have to focus. We need short and long-term fellowships, visa support, and rapid immigration procedures, travel assistance, and others. Now, I want to bring your attention to this point. Some professionals have been displaced together with their dependents and close relatives. We need immediate solutions to keep their families together. Let me give you an example. I left my name in one of those sites, and I got a, a, a letter from a, a graduate student in pharmaceutics in, uh, from uh, Kharkov Uni Pharmaceutical University. She's now displaced in Poland with her six-year-old. So I immediately uh, started the procedures and opened the position. But there is a problem. Here. She is in Poland with her mother. And we cannot bring to United States her mother because she wouldn't qualify as dependent. So we I am now right now looking for different solutions to bring her to Canada or United Kingdom, which is much more open and flexible with respect to these displaced people in terms of visa than United States. That is another point which perhaps the organization can bring to US Congress. Uh, we need to enact something that could help us to bring the families together. What about Russians? And there was already a call not to disparage all Russians. I joined this call. I think we must support Russians and Belarusian students and scholars who are against the war. 
we need to distinguish between the sanctions on the Russian government and the treatment of Russian students and scholars who oppose the war. A focus program is needed to help Russian and Belarusian scholars that are not implicated in the aggressive acts of their government. Scholars and students fleeing Russia and Belarus in fear of state persecution also qualify for refugee status. They need support from the international academic community. We encourage our international colleagues, and when I say we, it's the Russian American Science Association and community, because we have been discussing this matters and stating on them and will state uh, publicly, to sustain international connections and support Russian scholars who oppose the war but cannot leave the country for various reasons. Eugene Kunin, whom I already mentioned, has written in the EMBO, this is Molecular Biology Journal, a very powerful opinion letter to this matter. And I uh, suggest or offer you to read this opinion. In fact, when we speak about support of scientists still staying in Russia, it's not a trivial thing. And it's easy to make mistakes in this regard. To give you an example, very rapidly after the invasion, there was a call to stop publishing or accepting papers of Russian scientists because they come from the government-owned or controlled institutions. This call ultimately was not supported by overwhelming majority of publishers and scientific journals, and I myself, as the editor-in-chief of a chemical journal, Reviews and Advances of, in Chemistry, issued a declaration which uh, says that we must comply with COPE rules. But Russian propaganda has used that inside of Russia saying, multiplying the effects of these, and uh, frankly speaking, some of those signatories of this original letter I know, and I was within the very first group, tell me that it's very painful that they feel double pressure on one end from Russian police, on the other end, rejection of scientific communities. So it's an important matter, I think. I want to go back to the Definition of patriotism as the measure of shame for a person who feels for crimes committed on behalf of his people. That's exactly how I feel. Over years, uh, I was, since 2010, quite actively interacting in Russian academia and had multiple opportunities to speak for development of Russian science with those whose opinion matters. In fact, in one of those meetings, uh, I think we spearheaded a billion dollar program to support Russian postdocs. And uh, I had a feeling that I am talking with a dangerous but smart person who, who has the Russian interest in his heart. And I was trying to explain him what this interest could be for, from the standpoint of Russian future in science and technology. It's all gone. By waging this war, uh, everything we have accomplished as a group of scientists for 10 years and as a society in general in Russia for 30 years has been put down the drain. Have we seen this coming? Of course. 
we have seen scholars in prison sentenced and prosecuted for treason and other crimes. And we as a community, and me personally, have written statements and tried to protect these people increasingly understanding that this is in vain, but still trying to appeal to the government and the society. The latest case, uh, the rector, Sergei Zuev, but there are many others. And now we are talking about enemies of the state. For me, the turning point was the use of chemical weapon. I'm a chemist, and I have special negative feeling against chemical weapon. It's professional sin. Because some of the greatest chemists who gave us, actually, food to the humankind, uh, they also participated in creation of the horrible weapon which poisons human beings. So we wrote this letter, which was joined by 1,000 people there in Russia, and also both physics Nobel laureates in, against the war. And we were referring to the Sakharov Nobel lecture. Thinking about the future, I am not a political scientist. I cannot predict where things will go. I just understand that we re live in an extremely, extremely dangerous world. I don't think my parents lived in this world. In fact, not. Although my mother is still living. She is in Moscow. But she doesn't know about the war. I didn't tell her. But we face unpredictable future, a future in which more global conflicts could happen, in future where we might have more ad adversaries, in future where the nuclear weapon can be used, and we again don't know how to prevent all this, and we are essentially left with unpredictability. Is there a measure of shame that we should all bear as a humankind? And I think we do. We have supported the authoritarian regime for economic or political convenience. I have to be very careful here because calling for sanctions results in six years in prison in Russia if I ever go back. Let me put it this way. I've seen Russian people becoming more wealthy and happy, but at the same time, the solidification of this regime and transformation in what it became happened only because during all the time, during the Crimea annexation, annexation, I'm sorry, and other events, uh, Russia was getting huge revenues from the sales of oil and gas, and uh, those revenues are still coming. And uh, while we are calling to Russian people, and it's very hard because so many are brainwashed right now with propaganda, but we should not also go in too far in blaming the victim and trying to push away our own, I'm now talking as a Western society, blame for raising this regime. The international relationships have become increasingly adversarial amidst post-political convenience and shift towards propaganda. We know that. In, even in our own country, what we've seen over last years, we actually became weakened and that gives opportunity, the weakening of the democratic society gives an opening to dictatorships. We have been 
focusing on division versus collaboration. And here is China Initiative, and I was going to talk about China Initiative, but I changed my topic. We shall overcome. I don't have conclusions. I just have a message that we should stand united for peace, human rights, cooperation, and global security. Whatever that means today, and our goal is to, def to continue defining that moving forward. Thank you. Thank you very much, Sasha. And let me add to this that I just got uh, via messenger uh, something from Kiev from um, Alexei Ivanov. He does bioinformatics. And his message is in Latin, post tenebras lux. After darkness, there shall be light. Questions, maybe? Well, once again, if there are no questions, let me thank all the speakers. And again, we are in dark and unexpected times, but we must do what we must. Thank you. <laughs>